Beta radiation. Today we are focusing on some interesting experiments to demonstrate the properties of beta minus radiation. First we should clarify what happens during a beta decay so we can explore some characteristics of the resulting beta radiation. We will conduct an experiment on the energy dependent range of beta radiation and then move on to one about the backscattering of beta radiation. I'll use the backscattering as an opportunity to discuss potential interactions between beta minus radiation and matter. During a beta minus decay a new neutron in the nucleus is transformed into a proton. Along with this an electron and a anti-electron neutrino are emitted from the nucleus. The mass of the nucleide doesn't change as a neutron is converted into a proton which for all practical purposes have nearly the same mass. However the element changes because the proton number increases, shifting to the next element in the periodic table. This is an important concept used in transmutation, i.e. the synthesis of elements. The anti-electron neutrino generated in the beta minus decay is very light, which can lead to differing momentum distributions between the neutrino and the electron. Hence, when we talk about beta radiation, we refer to an average and a maximum beta energy. The spectrum is continuous, unlike the discrete nature of alpha and gamma radiation. I won't go too much into detail on this for now. But as a last important fact, there is a cutoff at the maximum beta energy because the neutrino has a mass and this needs to be accounted for. For this, first we need a beta only emitter. Often beta emitters do not decay directly into the ground state of the daughter nuclei and this excited state can also emit a gamma ray. This would interfere with our measurements as gamma radiation can't be shielded like beta radiation. There are several beta only emitters commonly found in nuclear labs. We've already experimented with sulfur 35 in a previous video. For this experiment we have a tallium 204 source. Tallium 204 has an average beta energy of 244 kilo electron volts. We also have some phosphorus 32, which we should use while it hasn't fully decayed. I'll prepare a source for comparison. Now onto a small crafting project before we continue. A small piece of paper is placed on a sample holder with a hole and is taped down. This tape not only secures the sample but also prevents contamination, allowing me to handle it later without gloves. I've labeled everything clearly and now I can drop a bit of the phosphorus 32 K2A HPO4 solution onto it. I even added a fluorescent agent just for fun. The crosses indicate the areas of activity, although I doubt anyone besides me will use it before it decays. Now we have a high energy beta only source in the form of phosphorus 32, average is 695 kilo electron volt and maximum is 1710 kilo electron volts and a low energy source in the form of tallium 204, average is 244 kilo electron volts and the maximum is 763 kilo electron volts. Next we'll determine the range of beta particles using aluminium foils of different thicknesses. The active site on the source is placed in the second slot and a new aluminium foil is added on top of it for each measurement, taken over 2 minutes. After adding the second foil I realized I had another detector available, so I measured phosphor 32 on the right and tallium 204 on the left simultaneously. What do we expect? Higher energy, greater range, meaning thicker aluminium foil is required to shield the beta radiation. It's important to note that I couldn't keep the same activity levels across both samples, so the table may look a bit different due to the differences in dead time etc. Here's what we found. First it's crucial to mention that the two sources have different activities and we've measured with different detectors, so I used two y axes. The individual values aren't directly comparable, but the trend is clear. What's nice is that I can adjust the axis to highlight various points. When comparing it with the literature we can see that Bremsstrahlung or breaking radiation is also noted, but I couldn't extract that from the data I collected. The range of beta radiation can be calculated using this equation. Our max is E max divided by 2 times rho, rho referring to the density of the material. Now we can move on to a backscattering experiment. For this the tallium 204 source is set up in this specific way. Unfortunately I was only able to get meaningful results with the tallium 204 source. The source is placed in the first slot in the materials of different atomic numbers, lead, cadmium, copper, iron, aluminium, carbon, are placed in the second slot. As the diagram shows, the backscattering depends on the atomic number. But why? 
Backscattering is influenced by two factors, electron-electron interactions, which are unrelated to atomic number, and nucleus-electron interactions. In the electron-electron interaction, the absorber's atoms are ionized, and this interaction is solely dependent on the electron density of the absorber, i.e. the number of electrons per mass unit. If this were the only effect, gold would be worse of an absorber than aluminium, because of the lower charge to mass ratio. In this Monte Carlo simulation, you can see the calculated trails of the electrons interacting with matter. The electrons have a energy of 20 kiloelectron volts. The red lines represent the trails of electrons that make it back out of the material as so-called backscattered electrons. This picture shows quite well that the interaction of electrons with matter or the absorbing material does not occur within just one collision but via multiple collisions. However, this is not the case because of the nucleus electron interaction which also plays a role. Here classical physics applies. A higher nuclear charge means a stronger interaction leading to more backscattering. Finally, the motion of the electron is altered when electrons are accelerated, change speed, they emit electromagnetic radiation, i.e. Bremsstrahlung or braking radiation. The energy depends on the strength of the acceleration, which is higher for nuclei with greater charge. This backscattering happens up to half of the penetration depth as the beta radiation needs to exit the material after interaction. In conclusion, the beta minus decay transforms a neutron into a proton and emits an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. The energy of the electron is not discrete and their range can be experimentally determined using aluminium foils. Beta radiation can be backscattered and its interaction with matter, especially the production of Bremsstrahlung, is quite complex. A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.